Welcome everyone. Today is National Astronomy Day, Saturday, April 29th. And we are excited to talk with you for a little bit about the importance of dark skies to um, astronomy and our enjoyment of the nighttime uh, skies. And so uh, my name is Danielle Adams. I'm the Chief Marketing and Revenue Officer here at Lowell Observatory. And I am a cultural astronomer focusing on indigenous Arabian astronomy. Um, National Astronomy Day is a day in which we uh, really get to focus on uh, the inspiration of the night sky. And we get to um, connect uh, those who are familiar with the night sky um, to those who are just getting started and build those bridges and, um, uh, and just help inspire that next generation of astronomers. Um, so uh, we hope that uh, you are doing something fun today in addition to listening to us. Um, but we're going to uh, spend some time together talking about dark skies for National Astronomy Day. Uh, I have with me, uh, my guest is Dr. Chris Lugenbuehl, and he is the president of the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition. So Chris, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Thank you, Danielle. Um, I was, uh, for many years, a professional astronomer. Uh, working at the other observatory in Flagstaff, the U.S. Naval Observatory, 30 plus years. But during that time, I also spent a lot of time, particularly as time progressed, on trying to raise awareness within our community about the importance of protecting dark skies. Initially, the focus was on protecting the skies so the observatories could continue to do their work effectively. But also, even from the beginning, but especially as time wore on, I realized how important this was to me as a human being and to everybody who can look up at the night sky. And I realized that people, when they think of astronomy, National Astronomy Day or International Astronomy Day or astronomers, they may think of scientists. But in fact, I think that anybody who looks up at the night sky can consider himself an astronomer of some type. And looking at the star, stars can bring uh, wonder and inspiration to everybody. And for every one professional astronomer like myself or Danielle, there are probably 10,000 or 100,000 people who can just as easily be inspired by looking at the night sky, even if they don't do research with telescopes or publish papers. So that's my background a little bit. The, since I've been retired from the Naval Observatory, I've been working heavily with a uh, nonprofit group called the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition, which tries to bring out this message that dark skies are important to everybody and from many different perspectives, not just to the scientists, and that we can really make a big difference if we, if we care about it enough to use light carefully at night, use lights in ways that are still effective at allowing us to use and be safe in the nighttime environment but in ways that dramatically, dramatically decrease their impact on the night skies. So we can see stars as well as our cars. <laughs> so let's uh, talk a little bit about um, what we mean by the term dark skies, because I think even if you live in a city, when you go outside at night, it's dark uh, to some degree. And so, um, you know, what do we mean when we say dark skies or preserving dark skies? Well, I think a lot of the listeners may have their own ideas of what they mean by that. And you're right, to your average person, night is dark um, and they don't necessarily split the difference between uh, the dark of a town like Flagstaff or a town like a large metropolitan area or an area out in the countryside, which is even darker than Flagstaff. Uh, when we talk or when I talk about dark skies, I mean really skies that are dark enough that when you look up, you're struck by your position in the universe because it's laid out uh, over your head. Uh, if you're in a place where the sky is bright enough, even when it's clear that you can only see a few stars or a few hundred stars, that impression is drastically inhibited. And you might realize there are stars up there and they may still bring inspiration to you, but the real 
knock your socks off kind of impression you get of looking at a sky that is filled with stars, so many that they can't be counted, so many that the Milky Way is a cloud of thousands and thousands of stars. Uh, that really is a, an impression that really adds value to the human experience. And I, that's what I mean by dark skies, trying to preserve stars or skies in such a condition that that inspiration is still there. There really is a difference, you know, like when you're in a city that has significant light pollution um, and you can see, you know, five to 10 uh, bright stars, um, you get the sense that there's probably something more, but, you know, what appears to be cloud cover across the whole sky is actually light pollution and you just, you can't access those further stars. But when you're out under a truly dark sky, um, you there's this richness, right? So you feel like, you know, if only your vision was better, you could continue seeing more stars. You know, you're not limited by the color of the sky itself, just by your vision. Yes, that impression of a dark sky, I don't want to diminish that when somebody looks up and sees one star even, and thinks about how far away it is and expands their mental horizons just by thinking about the distance. And hopefully they don't diminish their experience by saying, well, I'm not an astronomer. I don't know how exactly how many light years or trillion miles that is. Just knowing that it's far away can really bring a change in your perspective on the universe that you live in. So I don't want to diminish that even for people who have skies, skies that have only a few stars in them. But yeah, the real impression, the breathtaking, awe-inspiring view of a stuck sky that's so full of stars that you can't even imagine counting them. That's something which uh, dark sky advocates all, all across the world are trying to preserve. And part of the reason we're trying to preserve it is because we realize that it's really within reach. It should be within reach. Conceptually and technologically, it's within reach for many, many more of us if we just realize it's important enough to begin to improve the way we use lights at night. Once you become aware of how we use lights and what good lighting looks like and what sensible, careful lighting looks like, you can never unsee that. Every place you go at night, you will see examples of lighting, which is just going to, you know, just kind of gobsmack you to say, I never realized it before, but why are they shining that light sideways? It's right in my eyes and it makes it so I can see. It's not making it better or it's making it up even shining into the sky and just making the sky, the sky, the sky brighter uh, for no purpose and benefit or benefit on the ground. So we really believe that there's, it's all within reach. It's much more within reach. And really the main reason we're not doing it is because people aren't really aware that we can do it. And it's kind of a vicious circle. Once you get more light pollution, you see fewer stars. When stars are not visible, they, they kind of recede from your daily or nightly existence. So you think about them less, you care about them less, light pollution gets worse. It's just a cycle. So we're trying to break that cycle. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of uh, dark skies to the average person. Um, people often, conceive of uh, dark skies being really important for professional astronomers so that these enormous telescopes that are much bigger than houses even can um, see far into uh, the depths of the universe uh, from here on earth. And, um, you know, certainly uh, astronomers locate telescopes in dark sky sites uh, just so they can um, not be limited by um, the, the brightness of the atmosphere itself, um, but the brightness of the stars as much as can be achieved. Um, so, you know, that is an element, but uh, when we talk about uh, organizations that uh, strive to preserve dark skies or to turn bright, sti bright skies back into dark skies, um, what is in it for the average person? Uh, why should we care? Well, I think that you only have to talk to people under a sky that has stars in it 
I actually, you don't even have to talk to them. You can just stand there when they get out of their car and open up their eyes and look at the night sky. Uh, and you will see that it matters to most people. Uh, people are, we, we have an event every year in Flagstaff here called the Flagstaff Star Party. And so many people, you don't, you're not coaching them. You're not telling them that this is better because we're careful about lighting or this is darker than that or where you live. We're not getting into those details. We're not even conversing with them often. They just come out and their eyes are up into the sky. Um, hopefully not so much that they trip on things, mm -hmm. but they are always struck by just the wonder and beauty of the sky. They, they talk about, they just, you can hear the excitement, particularly in children with their parents. And the parents will say, oh, that's a planet. And the kids are just absolutely wild by it. Mm -hmm. It's something that none of these people are astronomers. Oh, I don't think they are, uh, but uh, not, not astronomers in the scientific sense and not paying a salary to look at the, sky, at the skies, but they're all struck by it. It's something I think that's also reflected in our popular, popular cultures in the way other, other uh, topics in science are not. In national radio, you hear all the time these little two minute radio spots called Star Day or something similar to that, where they talk about some astronomical topic and they're, they're broadcast more than one time or maybe a couple times a day on many, many public radio stations. What other science topic has radio spots like that, that general public and broadcast media buy into to, to share with people. Astronomy has an unusual resonance with your average person. So it really doesn't require a lot of persuasion or eye-opening. Uh, the main difference is just that too many people accept that they've lost the sky because they think it's inevitable with growth and urbanization. And to a small degree it is, but nothing like what is actually happening. I think also uh, something that you're talking about um, also in the beginning is this essentially awe, right? And wonder that can, that feeling when you're out underneath a starry sky, too many to count that um, there's something bigger than you, that you're being pulled into something larger than yourself. Um, and I think, you know, that connects really well to uh, cultural astronomy. Uh, you know, as I study indigenous Arabian astronomy, there are many stories uh, about the sky or um, star groupings in the sky that actually employ really faint stars uh, towards the edge of our limits of visibility without using binoculars or a telescope. And to have stars like that as integral elements of these stories is really something interesting. Uh, clearly no one thought that those would disappear um, on account of light pollution. Um, but when you see that vast range of brightness of stars in the sky, the brighter stars look even brighter compared to the very dim ones you can see. Um, and it, it just increases the richness and it provides all of this wonderful material uh, with which to create stories and name stars. So I think there's a, a really neat connection between, you know, this sense of awe and wonder we get under a starry sky and the stories that that awe and wonder generates and provokes in us. Um, and then on the other side, you know, that need to keep that kind of environment where it still exists in the world and to do our best to convert the bright environments back towards dark ones wherever possible so that more people can enjoy the sense of awe and wonder. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, here at Lowell Observatory, uh, you know, we get people who come and the observatory is just one mile from downtown Flagstaff. And Flagstaff is a small city, but it's still 75,000 people. And we have these wonderful dark skies. I mean, from downtown, you can see the Milky Way. And we get people who come and they see the Milky Way for the first time in their lives. And they're struck with that sense of awe, that sense of wonder. Um, and I think if we can do more of that, 
around the world uh, in places where it's difficult to see that, um, you know, we'll do our part towards making the world a better place. Yeah, Flagstaff wants everybody to come to Flagstaff to see our star sphere because it's economic and it's economically beneficial and people come to visit the town for whatever reason, because of Route 66, because of the mountains, because of stars. But actually the Dark Skies Coalition and I think a little observatory would really like it that we had more competition for this because more <laughs> communities, more communities can have stars. People can come to Flagstaff and be impressed and say, I want to go to Flagstaff to see the stars. But I hope they leave with a message in their head that says, I think I could see more stars like this at home if we did something better at home. And if I let people know in our community that I care about this, that we all care about it, and then it's beneficial to make it nicer at home. We like, you talk about astronomers running to the distant corners of the earth to get dark places for their telescopes. And some people may think that's some, uh, like a consolation that science will still proceed somewhere at least. But in a way it's a little bit like what happens if there's only elephants left in zoos? There's still elephants and there are baby elephants, but there's only a couple hundred of them and they're just in zoos and there's no more in the wild. Would that be a different world? I think everybody would realize that's a different world. It's probably not even biologically sustainable, but for human beings in night skies, we hope that we can bring stars back to pe the stars where, bring stars back to where people live because it's within reach. And that's one of the other messages. Once they come to Flagstaff and look at our nice stars, uh, whenever or during our star party, uh, which by the way, is in September every year. And I hope people mm -hmm. will go check on the web for it, uh, uh, that they also will get a message that not only are the stars cool in Flagstaff, but stars could be much better where I live as well. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk more about that element. So uh, Flagstaff, became the world's first international dark sky city in 2001. But that was after some 43 years of working towards dark sky preservation um, through ordinances and whatnot. So what is special about Flagstaff that we were able, we've been able to do this for so long and, and what can other people take home with them to where, the places where they live? Well, Flagstaff does have a little bit of an unusual history and you're sitting on a piece of it. In fact, right over your shoulder is probably the first, the first telescope to be located in Flagstaff in the 1890s by Percival Lowell, the one Lowell Observatory was established. So astronomy and Flagstaff have kind of grown up together. And not only that, but Percival Lowell was a particular kind of astronomer, which is very rare even then, but uh, nowadays I think is non-existence. And that is, he's a gentleman astronomer. He was the man who was a businessman in, in Massachusetts, I believe, and you probably mm -hmm. can correct my yep. history if it's wrong. Uh, but he also pursued astronomy. Today we call it as an amateur or as a, a well-to-do uh, private enthusiast enough to build a large telescope. Mm -hmm. and to locate it all the way out in Arizona from Massachusetts. But, um, but anyway, he, he landed in Flagstaff not, but not even 10 years after Flagstaff was established as a town. In 1886, I believe, was the incorporation date for the town uh, before it was even a state. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that special relationship that was kind of started at the get-go has always helped Flagstaff to be receptive to astronomy and astronomers. Uh, over the decades, beginning in the 50s, when lighting actually started to become an issue, uh, electric lighting outdoors didn't exist in the 1890s when Lowell Observatory was established, mm -hmm. um, I don't believe. Um, once once uh, the, we got to the 50s, lighting the town had grown considerably and lighting was being used. And the topic of how to use it more sensibly or so it doesn't impact the observatories uh, unnecessarily was taught, brought up at a very early time. So Flagstaff got a head start on that because of the involvement of uh, Lowell Observatory with the town and because of its initial efforts to protect the sky, initially from just something as simple as searchlights used to advertise the opening of shopping centers, for example. Mm -hmm. But then by the 2000s or so, the community had built quite a bit on that, adopting more 
comprehensive lighting standards to help improve the sensibility with the way the lighting is used. In other words, basically directed down onto the ground, not sideways or into the sky. Uh, later on, we uh, focused on using yellow lights for most applications. Uh, they were very common back in the 60s and 70s anyway, so they were kind of the standard anyway, these yellow lights. But anyway, by 2000 or so, when the Dark Skies Coalition was first mustering itself, we wanted to raise the awareness within the community for how good of a job they had been doing over the years. We kind of felt that it seemed like more people outside of Flagstaff knew that we had done a good job than people inside of Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. So we came up with the idea of the community, this group, the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition, before it was even incorporated, came up with the idea of a program to recognize communities who had done an exceptional job in, try, in improving, uh, in supporting dark skies, and then actually in achieving dark skies. So not only do we require, we have the idea that the program would recognize efforts, but also had to measure some kind of success. So we made, we wrote up a one or two page description of what this program would look like. We gave that proposal to the International Dark Sky Association based in Tucson. They accepted the proposal to create the program. And once they did that, we turned right around and nominated ourselves to be the first one. And it was successful. And it does exactly what we hoped it would do. And that is it helps to raise the awareness within Flagstaff and around the country and the world that we have done a good job, and this is an example of how the world can do a better job of protecting skies. It's not, you know, there's a lot of difficulties in protecting skies. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of lights out there and thousands of different people with different ideas of what's important. And it can seem insurmountable to many, but Flagstaff has really proven that there's something that can be done and not just a little bit, but a lot. So uh, as we get close towards uh, wrapping up, um, you mentioned uh, the special relationship starting with Percival Lowell um, between the city of Flagstaff um, or the town at that point and astronomy. And, you know, in um, Lowell Observatory's history, Percival was inviting the residents of Flagstaff up to look through his telescope within six weeks of getting started here at, um, uh, at Mars Hill, um, as it became known eventually. So, you know, our listeners, um, most of them are not going to have that heritage necessarily. Um, there may be some who have similar stories in the background. So what can people do who say, you know, um, I don't have that special, unique heritage of astronomy in my city or town, um, but, you know, my skies are still bright. You know, what, what are some first steps that people can do? Well, people have to, first of all, disabuse themselves of the idea that dark skies matter only to a few. Maybe they think of them as astronomers or stargazers, maybe amateur astronomers, but really it matters to nearly everybody. There are few elements or aspects of the natural environment which appeal to such a broad audience as the star-filled star sky. So people need, once they realize that, they can realize that this is, a, they need to realize that it's important. You won't put effort into protecting things unless you're aware of them and think they're important. So realize it is important. It can, it's even important to you. I mean, what, uh, meaning the person who's thinking about it. If you just go out and look up at the stars and you're awestruck by it, that matters. So you won't have the same history as Flagstaff or any other town, Tucson or any place that's tried to protect their skies. Your every place will be unique. But once you get that realization that it's important and that better lighting is beneficial for everybody, that's the second notion to disabuse yourself from. And that is that controlling lighting to make dark skies means you have to turn out the lights. Not really. The, the lighting in Flagstaff is not really any different on the ground than other places. In other words, what the illumination is on the ground where you need to see the, the ground, the sidewalk, the parking lot uh, is just, as, just as, as comparable to other towns. It's just that we don't waste it sideways and up into the sky. And that makes such a huge difference. 
-hmm. And so once people realize that they don't, need, we're not talking about turning out lights, we're just talking about using lights sensibly. You've heard me all throughout this conversation say sensible using of light, uses of lighting, sensibly using lighting rather than turning out lighting. Then that's really the second thing. Realize that it matters and that you don't need to turn out the lights. We can still be safe and still use our environments at night where we need light without polluting it. And we can cut down the light pollution by 90% or more, Flagstaff has shown, 90% or more, and still have the light you need on the ground. In fact, you can see better on the ground because light that's directed sideways not only causes light pollution, it causes glare and your eyes cannot see very well when they have light shining in them. Let's take a look at an example of that. So what this image shows is using cameras that you can actually measure brightnesses of, uh, well, the Milky Way, you can see a kind of a blotchy uh, arc of light across the top image, uh, which shows the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is also vis visible in the bottom image, which goes from the center up to the top. So it doesn't look as prominent. Uh, and in fact, it isn't as prominent also because it's a much more light polluted environment. What you're looking at is two maps that show the entire sky from the horizon along the bottom where you can see trees in the Flagstaff image on top, all the way to the zenith overhead and around 360 degrees around the horizon, folded in this strange way called a hammer eye projection. But what this shows is it compares the brightnesses of the sky glow over a city, the light dome over a city from about 15 or 20 miles away, 27 and 31 kilometers as it shows in the diagrams here. Flagstaff and Cheyenne, Wyoming are actually quite similar size. Uh, Cheyenne's a little smaller. And in the image taken on the bottom, we're a little farther away, both of which would tend to make Cheyenne look fainter. But in fact, Cheyenne is much brighter. And if you accept the brightness of Flagstaff in the middle of the top image to be equal one unit of brightness, Cheyenne is nearly 12. Uh, off on the right is another town, Fort Collins. That's not something we're comparing with here. It's much farther away and much bigger. But anyway, this shows the magnitude of the benefit that you can achieve by using light sensibly, the way Flagstaff has worked so hard to do for the last 60 years. Uh, these lights are lighting the ground pretty much the same as they are in Cheyenne. I've never heard anybody say that Cheyenne is brighter on the ground than Flagstaff is, but there is much less light getting into the sky enough so that Flagstaff is less than one-tenth as bright. So many more stars are visible in Flagstaff and the halo of Flagstaff into the communities surrounding it, the rural areas, extends much, much less far. So it's a huge benefit to have light that's used sensibly, not just a little bit, a huge amount. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really awesome. And it's really powerful to see visually the impact that having dark sky regulations in place can make for cities that are of the same size. So uh, to our viewers, uh, we hope that you've taken some inspiration from what we've talked about today. We like to say here that astronomy is for everyone. And National Astronomy Day is a really great day to emphasize that. Um, we hope that uh, everyone on Earth can have that experience of being out under a truly dark starry sky that makes you feel small and, and pulls you up into it um, as just a small piece of this uh, universe that we all live in. And so, Chris, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And um, uh, it's great talking with you, as always. Uh, and for you who are listening, um, we hope that after we leave and you turn off this uh, video, that you go outside. And if it's clear, get a look at whatever stars you can see, connect with your local astronomy group, and um, just experience the awe and wonder of the night sky. So from us both, thanks so much and we'll see you later.